Some of you have been around Trinity Anglican long enough to remember that in my 20s, I had an obsession with rock climbing. I had hair too. Thanks, Lanny. <laughs> yes, thank you for the reminder. My goal is when I go on sabbatical, I'm going to do a bunch of Rogaine and tell you all it was completely stress-related. It was completely stress-related, guys. It all grew back the minute I got away. Uh, yes, well, I did have hair, and I loved rock climbing. It started in the Tetons, uh, where Laura and I met living in Yellowstone National Park. And my two closest friends in college, Ben and Sean, we, we climbed a bunch in the Tetons during that time. And then it grew into a love of what's called sport climbing, where there's a bolt in the rock and the crags of the front range. But then it reached kind of a culminating point called traditional climbing and, and trad climbing because climbers like to have lingo because if you have lingo, then you can have outsiders that don't know what you're talking about. It's kind of lame, but traditional climbing is where you see an empty rock face and maybe a crack system or something, and you have to place your own gear. You have to place your own protection. And so you have these things. There's other things other than these, but primarily things called nuts and cams. And a nut, you can imagine, it just looks like an off-shaped nut that you place inside of a crack and you tug on it. And then you put a carabiner and some webbing in it. Then you fasten it to your rope. And hopefully if you fall, it jams even further into the rock and you'll be fine. You'll be safe. Then there are these other things called camming devices. And a camming device is kind of hard to explain unless you've seen one, but they look like four lobes that look like butterfly wings. And when you press the bottom, they get small and then you put them inside the crack. And the more you pull out, the more they expand. So the idea is it's not going to get pulled out. So if you fall, you'll be caught. And so in traditional climbing, what you have to end up doing is, is engineering your route to the top in some significant way. And climbing at the end of the day is ultimately about confidence. It's about confidence in your strength and conditioning. Are you strong enough to be able to grip that hold? Is your core strong enough for your toe to be able to pinch into that tiny crack? It's confidence that the rock won't break when you pull on it. It's confidence that your gear placements will hold, especially if you're above them. That's the moments that's the most scary, right? You place a gear and then you climb above it. And then if you fall, you fall the distance to that last gear placement twice because you fall and then the rope catches you on the way down, right? And then if that gear placement falls and breaks because the rock is too brittle and the cam explodes the rock or because you didn't place it very well because it just wasn't very secure, then you have to fall again until you hit your next piece of gear. But then what happens is that often what's called zippering is all that pressure just keeps popping them as you go and the end result isn't very good. But at the end of the day, climbing from beginning to end is all about confidence. Confidence that you have the strength to do it and confidence that the rock's actually going to hold you. And I often have thought that climbing is a beautiful illustration of life, that in our lives we have these objectives that we're trying to get to, these mountains that we're trying to climb. And it's all about the confidence in what we put our trust in. We don't have a specific sized foothold, but we do need a specific sized bank account or we lose confidence. We don't need a well-placed cam, but we do need a well-placed word of affirmation from our parents or we lose confidence. We don't need a stable belay anchor, but we do need a stable home life or we lose confidence. So often in our lives, we look at the course of our lives as this, this climbing from one place of confidence to the next place of confidence. And yet, what do we know happens in this life? When we place our confidence in anything in this life, ultimately, that rock is brittle and that rock fails. Whether that's our career or our finances, or our family, or our church. The things of this life that we put all of our trust in, they fail us. Because at the end of the day, we are called to have only one place of ultimate confidence. One rock that doesn't fail. One rock that can't be conformed to anyone or anything because he is the sure foundation. The rock of ages, the rock that cannot be moved. 
our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to continue in our sermon series through Isaiah 40, and we're hitting a passage that is going to hopefully unearth in us places in our lives where we place confidence. Because Isaiah compares God, the Holy One, as he calls him, to the two main things that we place confidence in in this life, idols and people of prominence. Idols and people of prominence. And he shows that idols and people of prominence fail you. They're dust. They will go away like the rest of the world will go away. But one and one alone is stable and secure. The Holy One, our God. And so Kyle prayed for me before service that I would be given a spirit of gentleness. And I do pray that because, you know, whenever we talk about idolatry, I think it's so easy to see the idols of others. And it's so hard to see the idols beneath the idols, beneath the idols in our own hearts. Calvin said that the human heart is an idol-making factory. You know, the idols that we project out into the world are merely projections of what is going on within us. And it's often the hardest thing for us to see. So let's just take a moment and let's pray that the spirit, the one who is actually able to topple the idols in our lives, would unmask those places that we are placing too much confidence and distracting us from putting our confidence in him. Let's pray. Spirit, uh, we are so blinded to the idols in our own lives. And yet we are so incredibly perceptive of the idols of others. Lord, would we see that as actually a work of the devil in our heart to so quickly see the idols in others and to so rarely see the idols in our own lives. Lord, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and open hearts to receive today? The idols you want to unmask, the idols you want to topple over so that we would have one place and one place to cling, one place to hold to, the one who holds us, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn with me to Isaiah 40. Look at verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. You know, we could very quickly overlook how Isaiah describes idols, but how he describes the idols actually show us what makes up an idol in our life. What does he say? A craftsman casts it. A human hand controls it. What do idols ultimately? A human grasping at control. An idol can be manipulated to get what you want. Whereas what we see of our God in heaven, he can't be manipulated by anyone. But first we see an idol can be manipulated. It's crafted by human hands. Then we see a goldsmith overlays it with gold and silver chains are placed around it. And then if you can't afford that, you get really good wood that won't rot. What do we see? It is a store of value. The things that human beings value, we put onto our idols as a representation of that idolatry in our heart to grasp at value in this world. And then this last one would be so easy to overlook, but it's so central to what idolatry is. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. What does that mean? It's a sure foundation. It's the place of stability. It's the place that you go to, to find security in this unstable life. Martin Luther in his larger catechism uh, probably gave the most, you know, historically um, well-known definition of idolatry. He says this, a God, lowercase g, means that from which we are to expect all good and to which we are to take refuge in all distress. So that to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in him from the whole heart. As I have often said, that the confidence and faith of the heart alone make both God and an idol. That now I say upon which you set your heart and put your trust is properly your God. This is the very beginning 
of the Ten Commandments, that there's one God and one God alone. And yet so often, what do we do? The place where we put our confidence, the place where we put our store of value, the place that we try to manipulate in order to get some outcome we are looking for is the idols that we project into the world. Now, the Israelites, if you look at the Old Testament, they had three main idols, Dagon, uh, and then Baal, and Asherah. And they're all, they're all a family. It's a complicated family, but they're a family of gods. And do you know what they all have in common? Do you know what they do? They're the gods of fertility. Asherah is the god of birthing fertility. She, she's a female. And then Dagon and Baal, they're the gods of fertility in the fields. Now, this is also why they engage child sacrifice. Because you have to give up your fertility to receive fertility. Because at the end of the day, idols always devour their worshipers. Idols always crush those that serve them. But why is that so significant that those are the three idols of the Israelites, other than the fact that that was their context? Those were the gods of the Canaanites, right? The Canaanites were in the land before Israel took the land from them. Because at the end of the day, what does fertility signify? The longing for security. The longing for security. In the ancient world, the worst thing that could happen is you don't have children. Therefore, you don't have anyone to work the fields. So basically, your small family business has no employees. And if the fields produce no crops, you're not, there, there, is, no, there is no bailout. Nobody's going to help you. And so when the Israelites began to sweat, when the Israelites began to see that the holds in the climb began really, really thin, they started grasping at someone or something other than Yahweh. And so they would run from Yahweh to the gods of the Canaanites, Baal, Asherah, and Dagon. And what do we know of Dagon, right? He's the one that fell down before the Ark of the Covenant. He... Baal and Asherah, they're the ones that devour God's people. These gods that promise fertility, promise security, those holds always break off. Those holds can't hold you up. The reality of idols is they're not, they promise security. They promise that when you're afraid, you can run to them to find some source of stability in your life, but they always let you down. Now, what are those in our lives? I'm going to try to just name some that I think many of us might struggle with while recognizing that I don't know each of your individual hearts. Often our careers become an idol in our lives because they're the place that we run to to find some sort of affirmation and some sort of stability, some meaning in this life. But they're an idol that will crumble upon you. It's a hole that will break out underneath you and they will devour you. Why? For two reasons. One, if you find your salvation in your career and you don't make it, what does it become? It becomes the law, not a savior. It becomes a word of accusation that you didn't succeed the way you had hoped to. Or, if you do succeed the way that you hope to, what is that lesson that we've all heard a million times before and we never seem to listen to? The person who actually makes it always tells us it didn't work out. The summit we're climbing is always a false summit. You say, is this really the view? And then you end up spiraling into despair because you set your hopes in something that can't actually hold you up. A spouse or our family, I think about this especially, right? Our, our quest to be loved. If our spouse becomes our idol, our spouse becomes our savior, what do you do if they die? The person who you put your hope for resurrection in, in is now in a grave. Who's going to lift you out of the grave? That person can't save you. Easy enough, we all know this pretty well, that we keep falling for it, our government programs, whether you're on the right or you're on the left, I would have thought by now we would have figured out they're not going to save you. How about this one? Our church. 
our church. When we confuse our Savior with his people, and it's very easy to do, what ends up happening? The pastor moves away and you get a new one and you don't like him very well, right? If you have a falling out with someone, the pastor doesn't do pastoral care very well. The doctrine, right, you're, it's not just perfect for you. A new social issue comes out and your church doesn't respond the way you, that you think that they ought to. And then what ends up happening? Well, this becomes the path that we're now seeing. I'm seeing it with countless numbers of my friends. The path of deconstruction where you're confused the church with the Lord over the church. And then you end up losing faith in the Lord over the church because you've made an idolatry of the church. Or even this one, this one's hard. Spiritual gifts. When we have a spiritual gift that we think is from God and we very quickly collapse our identity into it, and maybe people don't receive it the way we think they ought to. Maybe people don't think that the God is speaking through you the way that you think God is speaking through you. And then all of a sudden, your identity is wrapped up in what you do for God rather than who God has claimed you to be. And it very quickly becomes an idol that crushes us. Or this is one that I think is incredibly hard for any of us, our children. Do any of you remember the mother in hell in the great divorce? Right, The mother in hell in the great divorce who has controlled her son his whole life. And here's what happens. When we try to control our children, we make idols of them. And they'll crush us in one of two ways. One, they'll reject us at some point and walk away from us. And that sense of control, because remember, an idol is that which we try to control to get something from. We lose it. And then we lose who we are. Or they succumb to our control and they become a pitiable creature that we no longer respect or admire. Our children can't be our idols. I don't know what it is for you, but we all have them. We have a place that we are trying to control, a place that we are trying to find stability in, a place that we are trying to find as a store of ultimate value. And the things of this world, no matter what those things are, cannot hold us our up. They cannot be the place where we place our ultimate hope. It's an anchor that will not prevail. But there is one who will. The one who is not an idol in his very being, right? What is an idol? It's one that you craft. Well, who is God? He is the one that you can't control. He's the one that you can't fashion in your own likeness. That's why it begins, who will you compare to God? The answer is no one because he's beyond compare, because he's beyond a human category to manipulate and create in your own image. But so often, what do we want God to be? We want him to be the one that we can create in our own image so that we can manipulate him to do what we want to do. But that's precisely the, the opposite of who we need him to be. We actually need him to be the one who will not be moved. The one who will not be persuaded by anything that we demand of him. The one who is perfectly himself. To go back to the climbing illustration, that's the only anchor that holds. The rock that doesn't budge. And so, off, well, we'll get to that in a minute. The store of value, right? He is the one who is infinite value. He is the one that is perfectly complete and whole in himself as the perfect love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why would we run to any other place of value? We often get, we often get irritated, right? Because when we talk about God, what we think is, God, is there anything good in creation compared to you? Because compared to you, everything is like, you know, a shadow. And one, that's a bad, actually, view of creation. Creation is actually meant to point us and lift us to God. But again, we actually need God to be utterly, categorically above all other stores of value. The one that never diminishes, never runs out. The one that you can't exhaust eternally. The one whose view, when you finally reach the summit, it is all expansive, all consuming, perfect holiness. And there's only one like that. And yet, what do we try to do? We get so consumed with all of these other 
diminished stores of value. And yet when we actually perceive God as he truly is, as the perfect one that is beautiful and holy and never endingly good, it actually makes that which is secondary even more beautiful because it puts it in its proper place. It doesn't diminish your children, it actually magnifies your children because now you can, you can love them without needing something from them because you've received everything you need from God, right? It actually can make your career uh, more meaningful because you're not trying to find your identity in it. You're actually finding great joy in creation and service because you have found your identity somewhere else. You see, idols claim to give us what we're looking for, but only God can. And the things that would have been idols otherwise, your family, your church, your spiritual gifts, if God becomes the primary source of security, it actually puts those in their proper place. And they actually become magnified, better, a greater gift to us. They can't be our ultimate store of value, but they become far more valuable when we see the ultimate store of value himself, Christ Jesus. And then finally, this, this last one of a secure foundation. I think I've already discussed it. There is only one who stands outside of the winds of change. If we put our ultimate hope in anything in this life, what will pull you out of the grave when this life is over? There is only one that stands above the grave. There is only one that stands above the winds of change. And there is only one that you can place your absolute trust in. There is only one that you can hold on to. The one who absolutely never lets you go. That is the one who breaks all idols, who shatters them to pieces by his perfection, his goodness. The one who promises to raise us up in the last day. Now, let's continue because we don't only, you know, there's another, you know, people of prominence are idols, but, but we need to clarify this a bit. Let's look at this. This other thing that we put so much hope in are people of prominence. Look at, our, look at verse 21 with me. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. So often we look to idols in our lives for security, but we look for people of prominence for approval and affirmation. For approval and affirmation. Why? Because a person of prominence, he's talking here about kings and princes of the earth. But we have these people in our lives, whether it's the CEO of our company, whether it's somebody that's in the inner ring that we're desperately desiring to get into, or maybe it's our parents. People that we perceive as credible authenticators of merit, that's a person of promise, a credible authenticator of merit. And if that person gives you authentication, if that person gives you affirmation and approval, well, what that communicates to everyone around you is you are somebody worthy of approval because we all agree that person, that person's opinion is the one who matters the most. And therefore, if he or she approves of me, affirms me in some way, then that means you all know that I'm someone that's worth being affirmed, right? This is why, you know, so Ivy League schools, right? Ivy League schools are not about the education you receive, okay? Shocker. They're about the fact that you got in. Because what does that communicate to everyone around you? A credible authenticator of merit says, I deserve to be there. Therefore, you must affirm me. And so often in our lives, we chase after those that dole out authentication, those that dole out affirmations or approvals. C.S. Lewis, he talked about it as that 
longing in the heart to be in the inner ring. The inner ring that not everyone is permitted to be in, but if you play your cards right, you might get to sneak in. And you're always going to feel like a fraud, but as long as the people around you affirm you, ah, then you're somebody worth being affirmed. And we have all experienced this in our lives. And we all also know the impulse within us to compromise to get that affirmation or approval. If we know that our CEO does not care too much about business ethics, we will stretch every value to boost our numbers so we can be approved by him. Because then we know if we get approved by him, well, then there's this thing called, uh, you know, a, 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 a raise and a, a new position of authority, a promotion of some kind. We all remember this from middle school. That's why many of us say, you know, middle schoolers, we pray for you. And I don't want to go back because it's that season of life where we feel deeply that push to say the right thing, to act the right way, to dress the right way, to be in the inner ring so that the people who dole out credible words of authentication of merit affirm us and then everyone around us has to affirm us. We're seeing it increasingly in the dizzying nature of the mimetic culture that we're in right now. Uh, of our politicians where they have to affirm this cause on a Friday and that cause by a Monday. And they seem to be contradictory, but they just keep pursuing it because they have to, because their whole life is who will affirm me. It's called a vote, but we have this in our own lives too. But so often they're incredibly hard to see. It's incredibly hard to see who those people in our lives are that we think if only I had their approval, their affirmation, their words of support, then I would finally feel whole. I'd finally feel complete. I'd finally feel like something missing in me isn't missing anymore. And it's when these words, well, because at the end of the day, what does every human heart long for? Approval. Approval. We have all been longing for this since we've been born. We want to receive the smiling face of our mother, the smiling face of our father, and that impulse in each of us never goes away. But when we have that ultimate desire for approval in this world, what do we see? Read back this passage with me. Look at verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when, it blow, when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. What happens to the words of approval that we're longing for in this life? They become stubble. But where is one word that we can go to that can actually hold up the weight of our deepest longing? Look at verse 25. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these, who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. What is the one place that we can go to? Who is the one truly credible authenticator of merit? That's our perfect God. Our perfect God who chose to love you so much that he sent his perfect son to live a perfectly righteous life on your behalf, to die on your behalf, to take your sins away from you as far as the east is from the west, so that when he looks upon you and you are wrapped in his perfect son's righteousness, he can credibly authenticate your merit because it's the merit of Christ Jesus in which you are clothed in which you don't need any more approval because you've already been given the perfect approval of our God. 
What are we looking for? We're looking for affirmation of our value. How much more affirmation of value can you get that when the greatest person of prominence, the second person of the Trinity says, I will give up my place at the right hand of God, come and suffer for you, die for you, rise for you, because I love you that much. How much more affirmation could you ask for than that? It is only the one who can actually proclaim, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, and whom I am well pleased. All of the voices of this earth that you are running to, that you are clinging to, are shown as stubble by comparison. They can't hold up your deepest longing for identity. They can't. That one place and that one place alone is a place where you can find your security, your identity, the words of affirmation that you have so been longing for. Family, this is the one place that can hold us up. This is the one place where we can find our security and our identity. And may the idols of our lives crumble and fall so that we can recognize the one who chooses to hold us up. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the one place where we are held. You are the one place where we are secure. You are the one place where our identity does not move. Lord, would the idols in our lives crumble and fall? Would we see them for what they are? Would we cling to you as our only hope in this life? To the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.